Okay, guys, we are starting uh, chapter 23 today, and I have been talked through how to do uh, this uh, new way of presenting it to you, um, the uh, in-picture display. Um, so I'm kind of excited about this. You know, this is going to make it new and cool and hopefully more enjoyable and understandable for you guys. And, um, you know, it'll let me do some other stuff that I want to do, you know, that has nothing to do with teaching your history. All right. Chapter 23 starts on page 448. Uh, this is World War I, uh, 1913 to 1920. This is a big chapter. Uh, all the war chapters are usually big chapters. And this one is one where everything changes. Um, from this point forward, just about every chapter, you're going to hear me say, this is one where everything changes because you see more change in the 20th century than you do in almost the previous 200 to 500 years before that. Um, it begins on chapter four, it begins on uh, page 448. Uh, the United States had done much to become a world power in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, as President Wilson took over the presidency, it took time for the nation to learn the consequences of having its power. Uh, tensions in Europe were high at this time. Soon, a war like one never seen before, World War I, would affect the United States and most of Europe. In this chapter, you will learn what caused World War I and what uh, resulted from it. We're going to describe the major successes in Wilson's presidency. We're going to explain the events that caused World War I. We're going to describe American involvement in World War I. We're going to explain the problems with the Treaty of Versailles. All right? And you've got your opening segment here, and you've got these, the four pictures. You've got uh, guys in various stages of combat um, or getting ready for combat in the trenches of Europe. The scene in the bottom left corner um, is always one that has been particularly disturbing to me um, because, for some reason, the gas mask freaked me out. And you can see the donkey is even partially wearing a gas mask. and He doesn't have anything to protect his eyes. But they'll fix that. Um, they'll de basically develop gas masks for animals to wear before this is all over with. All right. Woodrow Wilson is the new president. Uh, we talked about him at the end of last chapter. Democrat. Um, his presidency was supposed to focus on the welfare of the working class Americans. He's a pro-business kind of guy wants uh, business to keep its paws off of the little guy and let, let America do America's thing. Um, the 16th Amendment comes into power under his presidency, which is the one that imposes income taxes. It was passed by the previous president and will actually kick in during his presidency. Um, he pushes through various reforms um, that will um, come into play throughout his presidency and affect uh, generations of Americans to come. He introduces the Woodruff, Wood, the Underwood Tariff Act of 1913, uh, which lowered tariffs and pretty much puts income tax into play uh, for good or for ill. The Federal Reserve Act in 1913, which created the national banking system to help regulate the economy. That one's going to be a real important thing uh, in about eh, 10 years. Uh, 15 uh, By 1930, it's going to be a big deal. Um the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914, which strengthened the federal laws against monopolies and trusts. He is something of a trust buster, uh, but not to the extent that Taft and Roosevelt were. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Federal Trade Commission comes into being in 1914, uh, which further regulates big business and keeps them from uh, engaging in unfair business practices. All right. Now, this is a map of Europe before World War I broke out. For the most part, it looks about the same uh, as a map you would look at today. But if you look in the center section towards the bottom, uh, this area right here, uh, this is pretty different than what we see today. Uh, the nations of Austria, the nation of Austria, Hungary, the Empire of Austria, Hungary, did not exist. Uh, Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, Albania uh, do not exist. Did not exist as they exist right today. Romania uh, was an independent country back then. You had the Ottoman Empire, which pretty much occupied most of what we could, we call the, the Middle East today. And Germany and Russia, uh, the, the shape of these countries was a little bit different. All right. Now, here's the problem. 
right? Austria-Hungary had invaded and annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, from Serbia. Uh, and tensions are very high, right? The Bosnians wish to be independent. Uh, they wish to uh, be free of the Austro-Hungarians. Uh, there are people in Austria in, in Bosnia who do support uh, the Austrians, however, and there's a lot of conflict between them. Right? The ruler of Austria-Hungary, uh, the emperor, Franz Joseph, wants to try to de-escalate things. He wants to try to cool the situation down. So see, he sends his nephew, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, to go and talk to bolster the spirits of the people who are sympathetic to Austria-Hungary and to see if there's a way to find common accord with uh, the Bosnians who are unhappy uh, with the annexation. Right? He's assassinated. Uh, this man, Gabriello Princip, you can call him a terrorist, you can call him a freedom fighter, depends on your point of view, um, is part of a group of young men who take this opportunity to try to, you know, strike out at the Austria-Hungarian Empire by killing uh, Archduke Ferdinand. Um, the first attempt, they throw a bomb at his car. They miss. And instead of the bomb, you know, hurting you know, the, the Archduke and his family, it goes off in a crowd and um, a lot of people get hurt. The next day, um, the Duke and his, his wife go to the hospital where these people are being treated. And as fate would have it, Princip was across the street at a cafe, eating a sandwich, drinking a cup of coffee, and he happens to see his target just roll up, all right? And he runs across the street, jumps on the side of the Duke's car, and just starts blazing away with a pistol. Um, he kills the Duke, and he kills his wife. Um... The emperor loses his marbles. All right. Um, doesn't matter that this was one guy. Doesn't matter that he was a lone gunman or, or pretty close to a lone gunman. As far as uh, the emperor is concerned, this is the fault of all Serbia. And Austria Hungary declares war on Serbia on July 28th, 1914. All right. Now, here's the problem uh, for about 50 years or so. 50, 60 years, all of Europe had been pretty much gearing up for the next big war. There hadn't been a big war for, you know, uh, quite a while, almost 100 years. Um, and they were all pretty much just waiting for something to happen to set it off. And they had all these secret alliances and, and under the table trees basically saying, if we get attacked, you help us out. If you get attacked, we'll help you out. Um, and these networks of treaties just crisscrossed Europe. Um, in some cases, like for instance, Germany, they had built up this tremendous military, extremely powerful, very advanced, sophisticated military. And they wanted to try it out. You know, what's the purpose of having a toy if you can't play with it? And they, they kind of, you know, some people feel like they wanted something to happen because, you know, they wanted to play with their toys. But in any effect, um, when Austria declares war on Serbia, Germany steps up and says, you know, we will honor our treaty and support you in attacking Bosnia, or excuse me, Serbia. When uh, they declare their intention to attack Serbia, Russia declares war on them because it's allied to Serbia. Um, France, in turn, um, allied to Russia, comes running. And Britain, allied to France, comes running as well. So it is kind of like a domino effect, as you can see here in this little, this little diagram right here. Uh, the one goes down, and then all the others follow in turn. Right. So that by um, just within a month or so, um, all of Europe is at war, or ju just about all of Europe. And it basically breaks down into two sides. Um, the Allies and the Central Powers. The Allies are primarily England, France, and Russia, uh, with a few others tossed in for good measure, and sometimes people change sides. And the Central Powers is Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. Right? 
Now, the war starts, and for the first, you know, several months of the war, 1914, it's pretty quiet. And one insanely amazing thing happens on Christmas 1914. Nothing like it, you know, to my knowledge, has ever happened since. And this is, it's, you know, it might even make me cry a little bit, you know. Christmas Eve, 1914. Austrian and German troops singing Silent Night. Troops start singing with day, the next day, of course. I bring the call! There was supposed to be a ceasefire for Christmas. Nobody was going to shoot. There were basically not going to be any offensive moves because it was Christmas. But nobody expected anything like this to happen. My name is Jim. My name is Otto. Please to meet you, Otto. Freut mich. Rose, she's calm. Schön. Schön. Gotta go back and kill each other. This is actually a commercial for a British grocery store chain. The two units involved in this particular little um, incident refused to go back to fighting. They just wouldn't do it. And they were pulled off the front lines and put into rear echelon positions. Uh, if they were punished, I, I don't know, but it seems very likely. Um, now, preparing for this war, um, there were already tons of defenses in place, but very quickly, uh, you see a massive fortification effort primarily in the form of a line of trenches that stretches all the way from Switzerland all the way to the English Channel, the North Sea. Um, you know, just hundreds of miles of trenches. And then there's all sorts of other trenches all around through this area through here. Um, the trenches at once made uh, for incredibly good defenses, but they also made the war borderline unwinnable. Um We'll talk about this a little bit more in just a second, but they created a terrible stalemate. Um, you would have hundreds, thousands of soldiers throw themselves at enemy defenses, trying to gain just a few hundred yards and being just blitzed to bits by 
every kind of weapon you can imagine the entire way. Um, it was next to impossible to gain ground, and if you did gain ground, that was every chance in the world you were going to turn right back around and lose it. All right? Um, here's basically what you had to get through. Uh, and they called it no man's land for a very good reason. No man could get through it and survive. Um, I've often thought I should incorporate that little bit from Wonder Woman in here. Um, but the guys are running across this area through here from their trenches towards the enemy trenches. And you can see it's blown to bits full of holes and debris, unexploded shells, you name it. As they're running, you've got, you know, planes dropping bombs on you and strafing you with machine gun fire. You've got guys in the enemy trenches blazing away with rifles. You've got machine gun pits blazing away at you. From way here in the back, you've got artillery just raining bombs down on you. And you've got to make it, you know, through all this with all that hell just raining down on you. When you get here, and the, you know, landmines. There are landmines. There are uh, uh, trench. Uh, there's there's barbed wire. You know, and if you get in the trenches. Then you actually have to fight the guys in the trenches, and then all these guys from the other trenches, they're going to come running. So it was just about impossible to do this. All right, I got another clip from you, a uh, clip for you. Do you want this to die? Don't listen to the police. It's a rifle. Shoot them, Dad. Understand? What If anybody comes running back, that guy, him, and maybe a couple others, uh, are charged with killing anybody who retreats. Anybody who loses his nerve and retreats. You gotta love the Scots. See, they weren't even, you know, 30 feet away from their own trench and they're already starting to get blown to bits. You have to get through all this crap before you can get close to the other trenches. Rifle fire, machine gun fire, artillery. No man's land. And here's the question. If some of your buddies did come running back, would you have the nerve to shoot them? <clears throat> all right. As bad as all that was, there, it, it, there was more. All right? uh, disease was rampant. Sickness was rampant. Um, oftentimes it was not possible to retrieve bodies uh, that had been killed and um, they would be left to rot in the trenches 
Um, so, of course, this became, you know, the, the bodies themselves could spread disease, but then, you know, the rats come looking for food and the rats spread even more disease. One of the biggest problems they had was trench foot. The trenches were often waterlogged uh, because, you know, there was not good drainage when it would rain. And your feet standing in this water would get blistered and even sometimes, as the case with this guy right here, get gangrene. And, you know, when it gets this bad, those toes have got to come off. All right. You had tons of new weapons used for the first time in this war. Um, the machine gun at this point has been around about maybe 15, 20 years. The Gatling gun, of course, is older. And it was actually still in use in this war. But you have the first what we would call honest, true machine guns that could fire as many as 300 rounds per minute. Uh, chemical weapons were used heavily for the first time. You had U-boats, submarines. The Germans loved their U-boats and you know, made great use of them. Aircraft and zeppelins uh, were used for the first time, both for bombing and strafing the enemy and for reconnaissance. Um, tanks would eventually make an appearance, but that's more towards the end of the war. And flamethrowers, uh, basically shooting you know jets of jellied gasoline up to 30 feet at a stretch. All right? And here's the big problem. We've got all these new toys, and no one's really 100% sure how to use them. So they're trying to fight in the old ways with weapons that change pretty much every rule in the book. For instance, cavalry is one of the best examples of this. Um, cavalry, we've used cavalry for thousands of years at this point, and we're still using it in this war. Um, but here's the problem. As fast as horses are, you know, trying to imagine, you know, a horse trying to get through no man's land. Uh, you saw how torn up the ground was, how full of debris it was, break a horse's leg in a heartbeat. Then, horses were just as vulnerable to machine gun fire as everybody else was. There's a movie called War Horse. And if you're a person who loves horses, do not watch War Horse. Because it's the story of a, of a guy and his horse in World War I. Uh, it, it's, it's like Old Yeller, but worse. All right? Um, you've got these various kinds of machine guns here. And I could not find a good clip that showed what machine gun fire does to a cavalry charge. Um, it was just as bad over open ground as it was, you know, trying to get through no man's land. Maybe actually worse because you have no cover at all in open ground, which is what cavalry had to use uh, to be effective. And so instead, I have this. This is a clip from uh, The Last Samurai, uh, which deals with uh, the end of the samurai culture, for the most part, in Japan. And the advent of modern uh, warfighting technology uh, and how those two things clashed and what it meant for the samurai. Um, this is a last charge of a samurai against the modern Japanese army. And all they've got is uh, Gatling guns, which compared to... You know, one of these, like, for instance, the Vickers machine gun you saw on the, on the previous page capable of firing 300 rounds a minute. It would be worse than what you're about to see.
the idea. Um, the chemical gases, the chemical weapons, they could be, primarily, they, they were shot out of, of cannons, uh, canister rounds, and they would burst apart, and, you know, they would flood um, the, fortif the, the trenches and fortifications with poison gas. You could also drop them from 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 uh, aircraft, and you could, you know, one of the simplest tactics we're going to see in a second, you would just basically line up drums and stuff, set them off, and let the wind carry it into the enemy positions. Uh, tear gas... Uh, was a blinding agent, make you cough, couldn't see, couldn't breathe. Uh, chlorine uh, would just plain kill you. This is chlorine like this in your swimming pool, but in its gaseous state, you would breathe it in, it'll kill you. Phosphagene and diphosphagene also, uh, nerve agents, they would just plain out, flat out kill you. Um, mustard gas is a blistering agent. It would burn you. Uh, you see the picture of this guy down here, the nurses and the doctors attending to him. He's, you know, got chemical burns from mustard gas all over his body. Um, this is one of the milder pictures I could find. There was some of them that it was just would not be appropriate to show them in a school setting. Um, you can see the casualties, you know, used from the from these weapons. Um, phosphagene and diphosphagene. Uh, well, that, that was the bad one. That that killed 85% of everybody who was exposed to it. Um, and you can look at the, 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 you know, up here in this corner, you see them, you know, detonating the chemical t uh, containers and just letting the wind carry it towards the enemy. Um, they, again, they didn't know how to use this stuff effectively. There's one story that says the Germans were experimenting with one particular chemical delivery system and accidentally blasted a hole through the French lines, and they could have walked to Paris if they wanted to, but they had no idea how effective the weapon was going to be. Um, you can look at the losses here on the casualty rates. You know, the, the injured or the casualties and the deaths are the, are the ones who, uh, who actually died from the weapons. Um, and you can see it's absolutely horrendous. The Russians and the Germans, they took it in the teeth. The French weren't much better. The British were right behind them. Um, but yeah, the Russians, we're going to see this in World War II. The Russians always seem to just catch it. Um, the casualties from these weapons, you know, you can see it's it's in the it's in the it's, it's in the millions. Um, were so horrific and so terrible. You can see the bodies. Um, that there was a ban. Uh, uh, put into place in 1925 that says you don't use these things. You don't use these things. And it's still in force today. Now, that being said, there's God knows how many countries that have stockpiles of these things still. And there's evidence that they're still in use. Uh, in the Sir Syrian Civil War, it's been going on for about 10 years now. Um, there's evidence that you know the, the Syrian government has definitely used them and that um, maybe even the Syrian rebels have used them. Right. We talked about aircraft. Aircraft was a huge innovation. Probably the most famous aviator of the war was Manfred von Richthofen, called the Red Baron. Uh, for him, this was you know something along the lines of like being a knight and riding your horse into battle. Um, easily the most. Uh, decorated and skilled pilot of either side in the war. He shot down 80 enemy planes over the course of the war before he himself was finally uh, shot down and killed. All right, I've got a clip from his movie here. Give you an idea of what air combat was like in World War One. Planes of the time period were described as uh, bicycles with uh, car motors and wings strapped on for good measure. Nothing even remotely close to what you call an air superiority fighter. are barrage balloons. They have lines trailing underneath them that you know, hopefully the enemy planes would fly into and get tangled up with. Uh, doesn't seem like they'd be very effective. Pretty much the only thing at this point that could stop an enemy plane was another enemy, was, was another plane.
those big old balloons are full of hydrogen, so they went up pretty quick. Explosives from your plane uh, down on enemy troops. Strafe them with your machine guns. By the next warrior, you'll develop good anti aircraft guns. But for right now, the only thing that can pretty much stop a plane is another plane. Move on. And flamethrowers. Uh, like I said, it shoots a jet of jelly gasoline about 30 feet. And if you could manage to get to the trenches, rather than you know having to fight each individual soldier hand-to-hand, -hand, man to man, you just take your flamethrower and you just spray back and forth. You fill the trench with fire. Um, not a way I would want to go. Now, towards the end of the war, the British will develop the tank. All right, um, incredibly primitive by today's standards, but uh, a real game changer for the time period. First World War technology, the tank. Trench warfare had made cavalry charges pointless. Armored cars have been used before and during the war, but they were also immobile on the muddy terrain of no man's land. A British Army officer, Colonel Ernest Swinton, therefore proposed a new fighting vehicle to break the stalemate on the Western Front, the tank. It needed to have a top speed of four miles per hour on flat land. You can run fast the ability to turn sharply at top speed. The ability to climb a five-foot parapet the ability to cross an eight-foot gap, a working radius of 20 miles, a crew of 10 men with two machine guns on board and one light artillery gun. Winston Churchill, who would later become... Sometimes these side pieces of the machine guns the project, uh, would be replaced by a machine gun. Basically what you could do is you could just drive your tank over the top of the trench and you could just, you know, fill it with machine gun fire or fire from flamethrowers. obvious for a name. So the term tank, because of its resemblance to a steel water tank, was used to preserve the secrecy of the project. The first thing we did tank from on August 30th, 1916. Cover for the development of this armored fighting vehicle. September 15th, 36 tanks made an attack at the Somme. Originally, there had been 50 of these machines, but some were bogged down on the mud. Nevertheless, British infantry used the tanks as bullet shields as they advanced upon the stunned German army. Soon, France started production of their own tanks, and other nations followed, although smaller in number. The tank, which helped to break the stalemate on the battlefield of World War I, continues its widespread use in the present day. This thing can do four miles an hour. This thing can do about six. Watch our other videos to learn more. So we Get your copy uh, of Civil History. World. Now, the war goes on for some years. Um, and for the first few years of it, it's the Central Powers. Uh, the Germans and the Austrians, especially the Germans, um, they clobber uh, the Allies. Um, Belgium and uh, the Netherlands are overrun pretty quick. Um, and they push pretty deep into France. Uh, before they're finally stopped. Uh, the Russians, they really take it in the teeth. Um, the Eastern Front is pushed back several hundred miles uh, by the Germans and the Austrians. They effectively invade Romania, Serbia, uh, the Ottoman Turks and the Bulgar Bulgarians. Like I said, there's other, other guys mixed in this too. Um, they invade um, Romania. There's fighting between the Greeks and the Ottomans. Right. Now, in the beginning of the war, um, this is the beginning of Section 2, the United States stays out of it. Um, Wilson wants the United States to stay out of this war. 
but believes that we still have the right to trade and do business with all parties concerned. Um, neither of the two warring parties like this idea because they wanted the U.S. to do exclusive business with them because it would help them and hurt their enemies. So, you know, routinely they would say, you know, we don't like you doing business with our enemies. To which Wilson would respond, well, we're not part of it. We're just here, you know, to do business. All right. Um, both the British and the Germans uh, tried to do what they could to prevent us trading with their enemies, even though that we demanded that there be neutrality and freedom of, of the seas. Um America being the child of many nations, uh, Americans basically, usually because, along cultural lines, felt sympathy for one side or the other. Um, German Americans supported Germany and the Austrian Hungarians. Uh, French, British, Irish Americans all basically supported the Allies. Um, but for the most part, Americans were still willing to be neutral and felt like it was not our war. It wasn't any of our business. All right. Um, in the North Sea, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, the British Navy set up zones of control along any place where the German, where, where you know, uh, ships might put into Germany and give them supplies. Um, anything entering the North Sea was going to get intercepted. And anything entering this area through here, from Norway down to Germany itself, and you can see that you know the German coastline. There's not much. You know, you don't want them getting in here. You definitely don't want them getting in here. This is their major naval ports. Um, the British Navy would intercept them. The German Navy, in turn, filled this area around England, around the British Isles, and the uh, coast of, of France with U-boats. And anything they thought might be carrying uh, enemy supplies was fair game. Right? Even though they did, for the most part, respect the neutrality of neutral countries, they would routinely threaten uh, to open fire on anything they thought was carrying enemy war supplies. Right? Um, the U-boat, the Germans used to great effect, the U-31. Um, crew of about 35 men, she carried six torpedoes. Um, she could stay down for a few days uh, with her battery powered in uh, with her battery engines, and um, as long as she had air and fuel, she could stay down. Um, now compare this to a modern nuclear uh, submarine, and what we get pictured here is a British Stute class submarine comparable to our Los Angeles class submarine. Um, as long as they've got fuel they can stay down they can make their own air as long as they got food they do not have to come up they can stay down forever all right because nuclear power they ain't going to give out a gas um so the, the difference of 100 years of technology all right now um the germans u-boats operated in wolf packs and as i said any ship that they were pretty sure was carrying enemy war supplies particularly if it was an enemy ship uh, an allied ship, then it was fair game, and they would target it and send it to the bottom of the Atlantic if they could do it. Right. In particular, one ship that was targeted was the Lusitania. Um, the Lusitania is a, an allied ship. It's British. Right? They believe that it was carrying war supplies. Um, it was also carrying 150 28 Americans, uh, non-combatants. Um, she's torpedoed twice. She sinks within 15 minutes. Um, and 1,260 people aboard were killed. Right? Uh, the American people are absolutely livid. Um, Wilson, again, sends communiques to not just Germany, but to all the warring parties you know, we are not in this. You need to respect our neutrality and you need to respect the neutrality of the seas. You know, ships at sea do not need to be targeted. Um, the American people uh, took it a bit more severely. Uh, there were critiques of the Germans for having killed 
Amer innocent American citizens, as you can see Uncle Sam bringing the Kaiser to task for that. And then there were also people who were critical of Wilson. You can see Uncle Sam here fishing American dead out of the, the ocean and condemning Wilson. All right. The election of 1916 rolls around, and it's Woodrow Wilson running for the Democrats and Charles Hughes running for the Republicans. Um, Wilson's primary campaign is to keep us out of the war. You know, America's doing pretty good economically. Uh, we don't need to get mixed up in a war that is none of our business. European affairs are not our affairs. This is kind of the attitude that we have had since the United States was founded. From George Washington forward, we have always tried to remain neutral in European conflicts. Um, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, all of them basically had to deal with you know French and British uh, forces, uh, governments trying to force us to pick a side and fight with them against their enemies. But for the most part, we've been able to stay out of it and maintain that policy for 120 years at this point. Now, Charles Hughes, on the other hand, is saying we need to get off the fence. Sooner or later, we're going to have to get into this war. We might as well get into it now uh, and see if we can help bring peace. At this point, America is still siding with Wilson, but it's close. Um, it doesn't look close on the map because, you know, Wilson, there's a lot of blue, but it's electoral ballots that matter. Wilson carries most of the, uh, excuse me, uh, Wilson, I said that all completely wrong. Um, Wilson sweeps the nation and Hughes, he takes the Northeast and the Midwest, the Northern Midwest. And again, like I said, it's electoral ballots that matter. He almost gets it. Uh, electoral college ballots, uh, Wilson got 277, Hughes got 254. It was darn close, 49 to 46. Um, popular vote was pretty close too, 9.1 to 8.5. Um, people buy into the, you know, keep us out of the war for now at least, right? But you can tell just from these votes, it was getting close. Uh, Wilson begins to actively negotiate between the warring parties, trying to bring about peace through diplomacy. Um, he basically just tells both sides, stop fighting, all right? You don't have to win. It can be, as he put it, a peace without victory. Only a peace between equals can last. Only a peace, the very principle of which is equality and a common participation in the common uh, benefit. Um, maybe that's a, a, a very good sentiment. You know, maybe to just stop fighting would have been the best thing, but that's just not human nature. You know, we want, we, we want to win, right? Plus, at this point, you've had thousands, millions of people killed, untold millions in property damage. Uh, at this point, it, it's become a war of hate. You know, it's not just a, a longer about politics. It's about hate. All right. You hate the guy on the other side. By this point, both sides are getting close to exhaustion. Uh, section three uh, talks about how America entered the war. Um, the Germans were doing a little bit better than the Austrian-Hungarians. At this point, Germany is just about fighting this war by itself. Um, Italy switches sides. Um, Russia gets knocked out of the war altogether. And the Germans figure they've got just enough left to make one last big push. And if they can succeed, they can probably get the Allies to sue for peace. All right. And they can control the negotiations and win on their own terms. So they turn the U-boats loose. And it's fair game on any ship, any ship at all, um that is carrying war supplies for the Allies, even if it's American. And they know this is going to tick the Americans off and it's going to bring the Americans in the, into the war against them. So they also send a telegram. Uh, the German uh, ambassador to Mexico, Arthur Zimmerman, uh, is sent a message telling him to propose a deal to Mexico that if Mexico will attack the United States from the South, Germany will support them and help them reclaim Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, possibly even California. 
Um, Japan is asked to enter the war as well, but the Zimmerman te- but against the Russians. Um, the Zimmerman telegraph is what kind of tips the balance. Um, the British intercept it, decode it, and send it to the Americans. And when that happens, it's on. All right. Um, April 6, 1917, the United States officially declares war against the Axis, not the Axis, the Central Powers. Um, we call up 50, you know, we, we call up 500,000 men. Uh, I believe there was a draft in state, and I can't remember if, uh, exactly. Um, and we go to it, all right? Wilson wanted one thing made very clear. This was not a war of conquest. We were not going to seize uh, foreign lands and keep them for ourselves. He said this was a war to make the world safe for democracy. We desire no contest, no dominion. We seek no indemnities for ourselves, no material compensation for the sacrifices we shall freely make. We are but one of the champions of the rights of mankind. We shall be satisfied when those rights have been made as secure as the faith and freedom of nations can make them. Um, this was not a war of conquest. This was a war to end war. All right. America goes on a war foot. Right. Our great strength has always been our industrial capacity. You can kind of look at it the way we're doing things with the coronavirus now. GM and Ford, they've stopped making cars or at least they've you know severely curtailed the making of cars. And they're making respirators now. Right? Um, the companies that make um, surgical masks and uh, face shields like 3M they're going to double their manufacturing capacity within the next three or four months, and they expect to quadruple it within the next 18 months. We can build stuff. We're really good at building stuff. All right. On the home front, uh, a war footing means that you build more stuff, like we just said, but it also means you produce more stuff. Um, Americans were encouraged to grow their own food in their gardens so that large-scale farms could produce food for the armies uh, and uh, uh, the armed forces. Uh, you were encouraged to, you know, not miss work if you, unless you absolutely had to. If you if you were still at home working in a factory, you know, you were part of the war effort because you were building the things that we needed to fight this war uh, to help finance the war. You were encouraged to buy bonds. Uh, which basically would be like, okay, you buy a $100 bond in 30 years, it'll mature and you'll get $300 back for it, All right? This is, you know, in the meantime, the government's got, you know, $100 you can spend on whatever it needs to spend on for the war effort. And for the first time ever, this guy shows up. Uncle Sam has been around forever, but this picture of him wearing his, you know, white top hat, his blue jacket, pointing straight at you and saying, I want you for the U.S. Army, this was the first time you see this. Uh, propaganda posters uh, begin to be very common. Uh, propaganda generally is intended to do two things. One, it's in intended to you know paint the enemy in the worst possible light. When we get into World War II, that's when we really see some good propaganda. Um, here you see basically the mother holding her baby, drowned, killed by German U-boats. You see the, 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 the gorilla with the German helmet uh, holding the, the, uh, the, the, the French maiden. Um, the other side of it was to encourage you and make you proud and to you know, make you want to support the war effort. Um, you know, he's keeping the world safe for democracy, enlist and help him, trying to recruit people, trying to keep them working like we saw on the previous other pages. All right. The first expeditionary force arrives in France in June of 1917. Two million Americans. Um, the American soldiers were called doughboys, and no one's 100% exactly sure why. Some say it was the color of the uniforms. It looked like uncooked dough. Some say it was uh, the habit of uh, cooking a sort of cake uh, mixed with flour and water that they got into the habit of cooking over there um, from a simple dough. 
The commander of the military force is John Blackjack Pershing, the guy who fought with the 10th Cavalry uh, in the Spanish-American War. At this point, like we said, both sides are just about exhausted. They don't have a whole lot left. So enter, as we said, you know, two million fresh American troops. Um, it's like a battering ram. All throughout this area through here, Amiens, Can uh, Cantonay, uh, my French sucks, uh, Soissons, <coughs> so on and so forth, uh, Ypres, um, the Americans come in and just hammer the Germans silly. Uh, areas where they had basically pushed into French, um, such as the Battle of the Argonne Forest, uh, Saint Michel, um, the Americans come in and just kick the ever living crap out of the Germans. Um, they're pushed back past the old armistice line, which is right here. And by 1918, for all intents and purposes, um, the war is done. Um, you can see here, this is, this is pretty much as far as the Germans advanced at their furthest point, And, you know, we're, we're just tucking in and clobbering them back, right on back. Um, the Germans know they can't win this anymore. It's pretty much done. And so, um, the Germans, uh, suffering crippling defeats, their economy completely destroyed by trying to maintain this war effort by themselves. Um, began to seek surrender and an armistice, a ceasefire. Obviously, the Allied powers are the big winners of this fight. France, Britain, and the United States won. Uh, Russia drops out of the war in 1917 because, as you saw from one of the previous slides, Germans were beating the crap out of them. Um, and we'll see casualty numbers later. The Russian ca ca casualties are heartbreaking. Uh Austria, Hungary, and the Inter Ottoman Empire are falling apart by this point, and German Germany's economy is completely devastated by this war. Uh, they've they've lost a generation of their young men. Pretty much all the, the European powers have lost an entire generation of their young men. Say like a whole generation of guys, twenty to thirty. A lot of them are dead. Almost all of them. Um. Now you got to think about this. Is going to basically be right on. We got the great. Depression coming, so this is not good for Germany. Um, the casualty numbers uh, for the Axis powers in total between the Austria Hungarians, the Bulgarians, the Germans, and the Ottomans uh, almost 3.4 million people were killed, uh, almost 8.3 million were wounded, 52% uh, of their total ca uh, of the guys who went into the war. Uh, walked out of it with some sort of injury uh, or didn't walk back out at all. By the end of the war, you can see who was taken in the teeth. It was the Germans because towards the end of the war, the Germans were doing most of the fighting. The Austrian and Hungarians came in second with 35%. The Ottomans with 10 and Bulgaria, they were barely in it compared to the others. The Allies aren't doing much better. Um, total dead is almost 4.5 million uh, almost 13 million wounded, 22 million total casualties, 39% to of, of the total totality. Uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, it's the Russians at 1.7 million dead, 5 million wounded, uh, 9 million total casualties, 76% of the guys who went into this war wounded or killed in some form or fashion. Well, wounded in some form or fashion or killed. The French come in second with 1.7 four almost dead, four million wounded, six million total casualties, 73% um, of their guys are either wounded or don't come home. Um, after that, it's the Brits. And you, we, you've got us down here at the bottom. We're barely in it at all. All right. You know, we came late to the party. So our numbers are very light, especially when you compare them to, say, the Russians, Romania, or France. Right. <clears throat> With the war over, or even before the war was over, uh, Wilson uh, outlines what he wants to see done differently. Uh, the 14 points, as they came to be called, 
uh, would become the basis for the peace agreement uh, between the European powers. Um, these included open democracy, no more secret treaties, freedom of the seas, no more U-boats torpedoing uh, neutral ships, uh, the removal of economic barriers. You know, basically, if you want to do business, do business. A reduction in armaments. Basically, we don't need... I'm saying basically a lot. Um, we don't need these super weapons. You know, these cannons that can shoot, you know, hundreds, hundred pound shells dozens of miles and flatten whole towns. Um, such things as that. Territory that had been seized was supposed to be given back, unless it was the Germans or the Austrian Hungarians. Um, uh, primarily that concerned Russia, because like we said, the Russians had took a good chunk out of Russia. Uh, the French got their territory back. Um, Austria Hungary was to be broken up into uh, multiple new nations. You were going to get the map redrawn by all this stuff. Um, he, the biggest thing he wanted was he wanted a creation of an association of nations. Uh, they came to call it the League of Nations. It would be a place where we could come together, representatives of all countries, talk out our differences in peace so that something like this never had to happen again. Uh, the League of Nations was, of course, the prototype of the United Nations. Now, the consequences of the war, uh, right from the get-go, you look at the Treaty of, of uh, Versailles, uh, and it's not a good treaty. It's pretty unfair. Uh, first off, it was decided by the big four, as they were called. Great Britain, Italy, France, and the United States. You'll notice who's not present for this. Germany and Russia was not present for this either. Um, the winners were going to decide what happened. Um, Wilson himself represents the United States in these uh, negotiations. Um, these are the heads of state. What France wanted out of this treaty um, was payback. They had borne the brunt of this fighting on their territory. Uh, they wanted to make sure that Germany was crippled militarily, economically, everything. They did not want Germany ever to be able to be capable of fighting a war like this ever again. Uh, Britain wanted Germany to pay for the war, for the economic cost of the war. Um, to this end, they wanted the Germans' colonial uh, properties to be reallocated to the Allies, and they wanted the Germans' uh, navy to be limited so that you know the British navy at this point the, Brit the British at this point have been the best navy in the world for about three hundred years, and that'll probably continue until the end of World War II. They didn't want anything to basically threaten their superiority as the preeminent naval power of the world. All right? So when the treaty is finally pushed through, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Germany is forced to accept full responsibility for the war. Germany did not start this war. Austria-Hungary started this war. Um, but the Germans are still given the blame for it because they were arguably the strongest ally, uh, excuse me, uh, central power. Um, the Germans were uh, forced to substantially reduce their military. Substantially. They couldn't have uh, an army past a certain number of uh, soldiers. You couldn't have heavy weapons like heavy cannon. Uh, they could not have an air force. They could not have U-boats. All right. Basically took away all their good, really good toys. Um... The Germans were given the bill for the war, which came to $33 billion. Now, that was at that time period. Uh, you can do the math and try to figure out how much it would be for them to, what it would be today. Um, it would probably be in the trillions, would be my guess. All this was intended to punish the Germans for the war and to keep them weak, to prevent another war from happening, and to give payback for the French and the British. It was an unfair deal. It really was. Um, and it would throw a tremendous amount of fuel on the fire uh, for when World War II rolls around, because the German people are, are humiliated by this defeat. They're further humiliated by this treaty. Um, 
their military is, is curtailed. Their economy is going to be wrecked by having to try to repay this huge reparations bill. They're angry, and they're going to be angry for about 20 years. And then they're going to take that anger out on the whole world. All right. The map gets redrawn. This is the map that we saw in the beginnings of the class, uh, the beginning of the lecture, with Austria-Hungary here in the center. Austria-Hungary is broken up. The map gets redrawn. Part of Russia and Austria-Hungary becomes Poland. Uh, part of Russia uh, becomes uh, the Balkan states. Uh, all along through here, uh, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary. Uh, these are all born. Um, Yugoslavia is born. Um, Romania is greatly expanded. Bulgaria is expanded somewhat. Greece is, is, is pretty much Greece. And the Ottoman Empire breaks up into Turkey and a number of Middle Eastern nations. <clears throat> a lot of historians look at the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and say this is the root cause of just about every problem you have in the Middle East to this day. So this war is still having repercussions a hundred years later. All right. Now here's the ironic thing. As hard as Wilson pushed for the League of Nations, the United Nations was one of the very few nations that did not sign on with it. Um, there was very strong opposition to joining the League of Nations. Uh, particularly from the Republican-controlled Congress. Wilson's a Democrat, you'll remember. Um, they point out two things. Um, that there is some legal uh, precedent for it. First off, they pointed out that the President of the United States cannot make a treaty uh, that puts the United States potentially in a position where a foreign power can make its uh, laws uh, and force its will upon uh, somebody else. This is why to this day there's plenty of people who say that the, that, the, that the United Nations is not a good thing because potentially it can force its will on the United States. We'll get into that when we get into later chapters. Um, <clears throat> second, there was the idea of foreign entanglement. This could pull, pull us into even more foreign wars and we'd had our taste of it. You know, 50,000 American boys did not come home and that was to a lot of people's mind too high a price to settle European problems. Now, with the United States never joining the League of Nations, it never has the power and strength um, to do what it was supposed to do, to keep the peace. And for the entirety of its existence, pretty much about 20 years or so, it'll, it'll, it'll more or less completely fall apart by the beginning of World War II. Uh, it's a, what they call a paper tiger. It has no teeth. It can't really do anything. Um and this will, you know, the United States will pretty much return to its policy of isolation. Um, Europe, Europe's problems are Europe's problems. Let the United States take care of the United States' problems. Um, <clears throat> some people argue that this is, you know, that the current trend in American politics is a return to isolationism and that it's a good thing. Others argue that, you know, the world's too big and we're all too interconnected. Isolationism will no longer work. And they point to what happens in World War II as what can happen if a country like the United States does try to practice isolationism. And I'll let you do your own research to decide for yourself how you th what you think about that. Now, really, when push comes to shove, all World War I did was set the stage for World War II. Um, a lot of seeds were sown, as you can see here. The the, 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 the German fellow, he looks like he's probably Gestapo, sowing skulls the way a farmer would sow seeds, um, planting the seeds for what's to come. Um, we get, we will gain new military tactics, new weapons. The Germans will, of course, walk out of this with a great deal of resentment, um, and certain leaders will, you know, take their first steps towards power. Adolf Hitler, Winston Churchill, uh, Mussolini, Stalin. All this has happened before and all of it will happen again. 
All right, I hope you guys like this new way of doing the lectures. Hopefully, this will make it better for you. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or concerns, contact me, text, email, phone call, whatever you need to do. I've talked myself hoarse. Um, have a good day. <clears throat>